I'm delighted to be back in Cairo uh, and back in Abbasiya uh, and with you tonight at Ain Shams University. It's a great honor for me to speak to you about our work in Beirut uh, at the American University of Beirut. Although I have played a central role in the creation and development of the Neighborhood Initiative at AUB, what I will be showing you tonight represents the work of hundreds of faculty, staff, students, and neighbors. So a, a few words uh, before I begin my slide presentation. <clears throat> it's always humbling to come to Cairo from Beirut. We seem so small and so insignificant compared to Egypt and Cairo and compared to you here in this large influential uh, university in this large and influential city. All of Lebanon's population of four million uh, people could fit into one district of Cairo and AUB, while it's uh, Beirut's largest private employer, uh, I'll say that again, AUB, while Beirut's largest private employer has only 4,000 employees, 8,000 students, and 800 faculty. Still, some of the issues that we are addressing in our work may be of interest to you in Cairo at this particular moment in time. Our work comes out of a series of large philosophical questions about universities and their social roles. Universities prepare young men and women for useful and productive lives. Some universities aim even higher to produce a new generation of thinkers and leaders that contribute to the development of their country and expand knowledge. Still other universities <clears throat> have an additional and explicit, explicit social mission to contribute to the public good and to benefit the people in the place in which they're located. For AUB, contributing to the public good has meant stepping out of the ivory tower and into complex neighborhoods and cities and communities. The AUB Neighborhood Initiative was was founded recognizing that during Lebanon's devastating civil war from 1975 to 1990, the university had become a defensive, inward-looking institution with few connections to the neighborhood surrounding it. In fact, the beautiful walled and flowering campus of the university stood next to a broken neighborhood after the civil war. So we felt that it was socially responsible for AUB to reach out and to share its talent for the benefit of the neighborhood. Perhaps Ein Shams is at a similar moment. I imagine that in post-revolutionary Egypt, all institutions are asking themselves what they must do to be more responsible to their society. How best to contribute to the public good. Stepping out of the ivory tower and into the neighborhood would be one way for a university to do this. And based on our experience in Beirut, when faculty and students contribute their special talents for the public good, they also become better academics and better citizens. So <clears throat> let me begin my slide presentation uh, to reflect on the name Mubadarat Hussain al Jiwar. Excuse me. Uh, we actually uh, gave quite a lot of thought to our name in Arabic uh, and consulted poets and uh, authorities in the Arabic language to make sure that the name that we chose in Arabic uh, captured the spirit of our work. And um, we have much positive feedback actually from our name when we uh, make presentations in Arabic. Um, <clears throat> also, um, the same for our motto. Our motto is El Jar Lil Jar. I don't know in Egypt, do you say El Gar Lil Gar? Okay, so that's our motto. Uh, I, 
Okay, so this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, first, I'll give you a visual introduction uh, to the neighborhood. Many of you may know Beirut and Ross Beirut, uh, but this will give you an update of the sorts of issues that we're working on. Um, then I'll talk uh, a bit about the basic facts of the neighborhood initiative, how we work, the substantive themes that we're focusing on, some illustrative projects, and then finally I'll end with some challenges and questions uh, that need to be considered by all of us uh, as we do work in neighborhoods as universities. So this was uh, the new university, uh, the American University of Beirut and its neighborhood in about 120 years ago. Uh, and um, you can see the, oh sorry, I don't have a, a pointer here. Um, you can see the, uh, one of the main streets that still uh, exists today at the southern edge of the campus and the sea all around the Ras of, Ras Be uh, of Beirut. It was an agricultural zone mainly and uh, the neighbors were, were few. Uh, this uh, gives you an idea of uh, what it looks like to fly into Beirut and as you're approaching, um, I don't, me, do you have a pointer by any chance? No, and I didn't bring one either. I, I don't think, uh, uh, oh yes, there it goes. Okay, there it goes. Oops. Um, the, uh, the green space right in the front of the city as you're landing uh, is actually uh, the American University of Beirut. And Beirut is a city that doesn't have many parks uh, or public green spaces. And so AUB is actually the largest private green space in the city and the lungs uh, of the city. This, uh, from a satellite image, you can see um, uh, uh, of course AUB and the red street is uh, Bliss Street, uh, the southern edge of the campus. Uh, at the northern edge is the Corniche, the seaside Corniche, which is, um, many people call it Beirut's most important linear public space. Uh, so we're surrounded by uh, the Corniche to the north and Bliss Street to the south. Um, this uh, uh, Faisal's restaurant uh, was a great and legendary meeting place uh, in the neighborhood uh, until it closed uh, here just before or just after it closed in 1985 during the Civil War. Uh, it was a place where it's just opposite our from our main gate on Bliss Street. It was a place where poets and professors and revolutionaries met to drink coffee and have tea. Uh, and I. As a sign of the times, it is now currently a McDonald's. And the next couple slides show uh, images of buildings that still exist in the neighborhood, uh, buildings that still show scars from the Civil War. Uh, and especially when you look up above the ground floor, you see those scars. Uh, there still are uh, some small, low-rise, early 20th century apartment buildings surrounded by private gardens in the neighborhood, but these are rapidly disappearing. And this is an example. Uh, the, the neighborhood uh, has always been described as Beirut's most diverse neighborhood in an economic sense, in a sectarian sense. Um, before the Civil War, it was predominantly a middle-class neighborhood. Um, since the end of the Civil War, uh, the rich have grown richer and the poor poorer, and this is an example of a building where the less well-off uh, residents of the neighborhood would live. In a building like this, you would expect probably not to have a functioning lift or uh, uh, round-the-clock electricity, certainly not, um, probably shortages of water as well. <clears throat> but this is actually the new war that's taking place uh, in our neighborhood, and that is the d destruction of low- and middle-rise 
buildings to make way for higher rise buildings. And this is an issue that we're very concerned about and are going to try to address in, our, in the neighborhood initiative. And instead, what, what's being put in the place of the low and middle rise buildings are luxury towers, especially on land that has campus views and sea views. So, so some basic facts uh, about the neighborhood initiative. The Neighborhood Initiative encourages AUB faculty, staff, and students to apply their expertise to solving the problems of concern to our neighbors in Ross Bay Root. We have a geographical focus, which is the district just uh, immediately surrounding the university, Ross Bay Root. Uh, and to determine our priorities, uh, we began with one year of intensive background research and in-depth interviews in the neighborhood with residents and businesses. We were launched formally in 2007, so we're now about six years old. Um, the, the neighborhood initiative is based in the president's office of the university. And we have activities supported by foundation grants but the two staff we have, myself and our outreach coordinator, are covered, our salaries are covered by the university budget. So uh, why are we doing the Neighborhood Initiative? Um, uh, we, we basically have two rationales. We think that it is socially responsible for AUB to try to make a positive difference uh, in our neighborhood, uh, but we also think that uh, this engagement with the neighborhood will enrich the university's central academic mission by uh, connecting the faculty and students to real world problems. So we talk about mutual benefit, uh, not a one way uh, good works from us to them. Uh, we see the Neighborhood Initiative as strongly benefiting us uh, and our research and our teaching, not just uh, us benefiting the neighborhood through our work. So how do we work? Um, our starting point, we, we say we're responsive, our starting point is our neighbor's concerns. And actually, this is an interesting point because um, uh, we say that we're responsive and this is very different than coming up with a strategic plan for 10 years where we say what our priorities are going to be or even uh, sometimes what funders want to say what we're going to be doing, what our priorities are. We say we are instead always wanting to respond to what our neighbors are concerned about rather than to impose uh, impose an agenda on our neighbors. Uh, we're catalytic. We are always trying to find the intersection between what neighbors are concerned about and what our faculty colleagues are interested in. And then we work to form multidisciplinary teams to address the problems uh, and um, connect with external stakeholders. Um, we are also supportive. We play a large facilitation role. Um, uh, everything from uh, organizing meetings, making introductions and connections to the neighbor, to neighbors, bringing neighbors to meetings uh, on campus with colleagues, writing up minutes, uh, uh, making tea, photocopying, or whatever needs to be done to facilitate the work um, we do. And then finally, um, we are participatory. Uh, everything that we do uh, is organized in full uh, partnership and consultation with our neighbors. So some of the substantive themes, just briefly, and then I will go into them in more detail. Congestion, uh, the well-being of older people, um, the growing gap between rich and poor, uh, the gentrification of the neighborhood. 
So we have, generally speaking, three substantive uh, themes uh, under which we work. The first, urban environment. The second, community and well-being. And the third, protecting Ross Bay Root diversity. Let me just highlight some of these, and then I will go into more detail in each of the in, in many of these projects. Um, if you were to ask our neighbors what uh, is um, one one of the major issues affecting life uh, in the neighborhood, they would probably say congestion. And so, one of the first things we did was. Um, go to people who know something about congestion. This is this finding the intersection between neighborhood interests and concerns and our faculty interests, uh, colleagues in civil engineering and urban design, and um, try to address the problem of neighborhood congestion. I'll, I'll go into detail in a moment. The same greening, um, again, if you were to ask neighbors what they're concerned about, um, they might say the neighborhood is becoming a concrete jungle, uh, all of the uh, low-rise buildings are being pulled down and the gardens are going with it. There's no place to create any greenery, there's no green public space. Um, the only way that we can uh, promote greenery is uh, on walls or roofs or on balconies. So greening the neighborhood um, it was a response to the concern that the neighborhood is becoming a concrete jungle with the densification. We also um, have heard from many uh, about the problem of being a pedestrian. Um, I think in some ways Beirut is a more difficult place to be a pedestrian than even Cairo. Um, and uh, so uh, we uh, set up a, a project to address the problem of how to be, uh, of being a pedestrian in, in the neighborhood streets. And finally, uh, the issue of silence. Like Cairo, Beirut is a very noisy city, and we, we know already that noise, levels of noise have tremendous effects on the well-being of the population living in noisy places. And so uh, we are undertaking a new project on the whole issue of noise uh, in the city. Uh, so, <clears throat> under community and well-being, um, we uh, also heard many times from neighbors that they really have no idea, since the war, who actually is living in Ross Beirut and um, how uh, the economic changes are affecting the well-being of our neighbors. So we organized a survey to try to get some answers uh, about the well-being of our neighbors. Similarly, um, we've created a program for older people in the neighborhood, Jamia Tel Kibar University for Seniors, which I'll talk about. <clears throat> and we've um, uh, worked with neighborhood restaurants on uh, anticipating the new ban uh, for smoke, smoking in buildings uh, in Lebanon. Uh, I won't go into the others in, in detail uh, in the future, but we're, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, other programs around memory and oral history. Um, we are very concerned about the well-being of small family businesses in the neighborhood, and our business school is undertaking a feasibility study to um, look at if the business school could work with neighborhood businesses to help them survive in the current uh, economic situation. And we're, just, we're, we're also planning a conference on gentrification. So let me go through some of these uh, in a little bit more detail so you can get an idea of how we work with our colleagues. <clears throat> when we talk about the neighborhood congestion studies, we're actually referring to three uh, studies. The first is reducing the conflict between walking and driving on the southern edge of, southern edge of campus, uh, Bliss Street. Bliss Street uh, is a very crowded street where cars are dropping off students and employees. Uh, the, there are lots of fast food restaurants and 
uh, cars double and triple parking on the street. The street is rather chaotic. And so the study uh, actually looks at ways to improve the uh, flow of traffic and the pedestrian experience on this street that is really the southern edge of campus. We're also, um, we've done some work on uh, improved parking scenarios and also innovations in public transit. Um, I think those of you who have thought about congestion probably know that when cities build more roads and allow more cars and, and create more parking garages, um, uh, the, the city will only become more congested and public transportation is really the solution to um, the uh, problem of congestion, uh, which the university contributes to very substantially in our neighborhood. We are guilty of uh, adding to congestion in our neighborhood. Um, so one of the things that we've, we're looking at in the third study is the way that um, AUB might help set up some sort of a shared ride service that might uh, be different than public transport. Unfortunately, um, in Lebanon, the government is weak and uh, corrupt, and so uh, we expect that there will be very few uh, improvements in public transportation anytime soon. So one of the things we're looking at in the third study is whether there could be some way that we could, as an institution, get people out of their private cars and into some sort of shared public transport shared transport of some sort. So just to say, the red street is Bliss Street, where we're working especially hard. Um, this, uh, the neighborhood congestion studies began in 2008, so, and we still are uh, undertaking different kinds of aspects of research here uh, over these five years. We're working mainly, as I mentioned, with civil engineering and urban design. Uh, we've also been working uh, very closely with our university administration, local businesses, government decision makers, and developers. And in terms of innovative solutions, um, and actually shows that one of the things that we have, um, uh, the university administration has agreed to is uh, a plan to actually change the university wall, to move the university wall back to create drop-off zones to allow the traffic to flow more freely on Bliss Street. And as I mentioned, we're in the process of creating a shared ride service, doing research on a shared ride service. Okay, the next uh, project, um, uh, the street, uh, another major street in the neighborhood is Jean d'Arc, um, and we're in the process of creating a model pedestrian street in, on Jean d'Arc. The aim is to create a barrier-free route accessible to all between Bliss Street and Hamra Street, two main thoroughfares in the neighborhood. As you can see from these images, the state of sidewalks uh, is very poor. Uh, there are uh, obstacles, uh, they're broken, uh, they're now you can't see in these pictures, but there are uh, cars and motorcycles often parked on sidewalks, making it very difficult for uh, everybody to walk. But especially uh, if you have limited mobility, if you have a disability, um, if you're an older person, if your if you're parents uh, traveling with small children, it's very difficult to walk in neighborhood streets. This just, this just shows uh, where Jean d'Arc Street is. The yellow street is Jean d'Arc. So uh, perhaps I could describe the iterative process. This is a more recent of the projects that we've started. Uh, our research uh, included many different aspects of research. Um, an anthropologist uh, and filmmaker made a video 
uh, of a wheelchair user trying to navigate a street on a sidewalk, and we used it in advocacy with the municipality. We conducted many in-depth interviews with uh, different stakeholders, uh, older people, persons with disabilities, activists, um, experts in accessible, accessible design. Um, we also, as you can see from this image, did um, what we call body mapping of obstructions with a colleague who uh, is blind uh, and to actually document very clearly what the what, uh, how a blind person would walk uh, on Jean d'Arc Street. And then other things, a physical survey, reviewing existing guidelines for accessible urban design, consultations with local experts, and traffic analysis. And this information, that all of this research fed into uh, a series of design charrettes that we had over time with uh, colleagues from the urban design, landscape design, an architecture community. And just uh, two nights ago, we made our final presentation to the Beirut municipality, uh, and they are um, prepared to implement the design that we have drawn up uh, this year to become a model walkable street for Beirut. So we're very pleased, and, and actually, this is an interesting question uh, when it comes to the link between research and implementation. Um, we have done the design research for the, the model pedestrian street, but it will be the Beirut municipality uh, who's actually implementing the design. I'll, I'll come back to this question of implementation later. Uh, this is a relatively new project um, that we've started uh, in the fall of 2012. Uh, the aim is to focus attention on the problem of noise in Beirut through research, advocacy, and temporary interventions. Um, in the fall, we actually sent out a message to all of the university faculty asking if who was interested in working on the problem of noise. And many, many faculty replied to our uh, query. And we have now, uh, for the first time, a group of faculty from every faculty in the university working with us on the question of noise, from audiology, psychiatry, environmental health, psychology, fine arts, graphic designs, engineering, even business information systems. And we spent the first six months or so simply listening to each other, how each other, how we, from our disciplinary perspective, uh, work and approach the topic of noise. And what we plan is a noise map of the neighborhood. We plan some awareness raising in AUB policy advocacy and creating some temporary installations uh, and itineraries highlighting silence on campus and in the neighborhood and possibly even encouraging a permanent tranquility zone in the medical center. Um, so. Greening the neighborhood. Um, Again, as I mentioned, uh, there are very few places to green Beirut at the moment. Uh, the, the, uh, there are very few public spaces, uh, ex uh, green public spaces around. And so the objective uh, of greening the neighborhood is to use native species, rainwater, and local materials for urban agriculture and where the components are green walls, green roofs, and rainwater harvesting. I should mention that um, Beirut gets quite a bit of rain in the winter, it's unlike Cairo, and most of the rainwater washes out to the sea. And um, even though there's a, a very long tradition of rainwater harvesting in rural Lebanon, there's not an urban tradition of rainwater catchment. And so, we're in the process of creating 
we hope, what will become uh, uh, an urban tradition of rainwater catchment. This is a, it's a little bit difficult to read, but this is a poster that uh, in some civil engineering students did after they designed a rainwater catchment system for a neighborhood school as part of uh, a course that they were doing. And this is um, uh, one of the um, visits to school by, uh, by, visits to the AUB greenhouse by school children from neighborhood schools to look at how you might construct a green wall. And you can see um, perhaps uh, in this picture that we're using the plastic boxes that vegetables are sold in in shops. And uh, we're, we're using simple uh, materials to create affordable uh, ways to create green walls that then could be used for ornamental or even uh, uh, food, food uh, plants. So Greening the Neighborhood uh, began about three years ago. Um, and I should say that um, we have much, work, much more research to do uh, on the, the topic of green roofs. Our colleagues in horticulture um, spent a lot of time collecting native plants from uh, the Lebanese coast and have been cultivating these wild plants in the greenhouse under different conditions over a number of seasons. So this work has taken some time. It's not been something that has happened uh, immediately. Uh, we've also been doing some trials with uh, different kinds of composting possibilities to create soil, inexpensive soil. And as I mentioned, our engineering students have been designing rainwater catchment systems. Uh, and as I, as I showed, we have, uh, we've created uh, educational programs for school children uh, to come and actually plant boxes uh, that then they can take home for green walls. And we hope to work in the future with residential buildings for both rainwater and greening. Um, the well-being survey, uh, uh, it's a demographic and health uh, survey uh, of Ross Bay Root and the conditions that are affecting well-being. Um, we have had partners working with us from economics, anthropology, sociology, biostatistics, and epidemiology. Um, we've also worked with individual neighbors on uh, designing the, the, the study and with <coughs> policy makers. Um, and perhaps uh, just to uh, discuss this picture, one of the things that we did when we had some preliminary results was uh, create 10 large posters uh, with some of our findings uh, with very simple graphics and we just stood next to the 10 posters uh, at three different locations in the neighborhood on the street and our neighbors actually came and commented on the findings. In fact it was quite interesting because sometimes they said they didn't agree with some of the things we found. They questioned our findings for example on the level of indebtedness and uh, other things. So we're, we're trying uh, with the Rossby Wellbeing Survey to make our results uh, very accessible to the public uh, and to open a discussion about what determines well-being in the neighborhood. Just some preliminary findings. 32% uh, live in poorly maintained buildings in our neighborhood. 31% have no natural light in their living room. 24% are one-person households, uh, which may be surprising to you. And 10% of participating households con uh, uh, contained children uh, below the age of 14. That means 90% of participating households didn't have any children below the age of 14. So we have an aging population in the neighborhood. And it was very helpful for us to actually see these numbers and understand the composition of our neighborhood. And it's a well-educated 
neighborhood fees. So as we just said, uh, we have uh, substantial numbers of older people living in the neighborhood. And so one of the questions was, how do we reach out to our older neighbors? And we have created what we're calling Jamiat al-Kibar, uh, AUB's program to address the aspirations of older people to remain active, useful, and learning new things. We, um, in 2008, uh, again, uh, now five years ago, we began an extensive feasibility study to, to really understand what would be possible uh, to do for older people uh, in the neighborhood. And we've created this program. Um, we've studied models elsewhere in the world. And the program, uh, we say, has three principles or innovations. It's peer-led. It's a community building program. And, and it fosters intergenerational connections. Peer by peer-led, we mean that uh, there are no paid professional teachers the program is run by volunteers, most of whom are seniors themselves. And it's, it's based on the idea that everyone has something to contribute to the University for Seniors. It's not just about professionals. Everybody has something to contribute. It's a very powerful thing for older people to feel that they have something to contribute. Also, um, it's community building. People don't pay for a course, they join, they join the University for Seniors. They become members of a community that has many social activities, not just courses. And finally, um, we feel that it's very important to welcome grandparents back to the university and to create activities between these grandparents and the regular students of the university. So uh, now, in 2013, um, we have 110 dues-paying members. Uh, we have 750 who are interested. Our membership fees are relatively modest, um, $150 a term. Um, we have uh, a full program of study groups, lectures, uh, educational trips around Lebanon and previously to Syria. <coughs> Just mentioning briefly, um, the um, AUB has a large uh, tobacco research group uh, composed of faculty members from different faculties. And um, they asked us if we would create a program to anticipate the national smoking ban that went to into effect last September. And to work with neighborhood restaurants to anticipate the ban, train waiters on dealing with customers who might want to smoke. Um, and so we created a program with neighborhood restaurants and our colleagues in the tobacco group. And um, had a, organized a large neighborhood party on the evening of the ban um, that celebrated uh, smoke-free indoor spaces. Um, and I should say that, in a way, this is the most straightforward and easiest of the projects that we have uh, undertaken. We started uh, in, in, the project was about uh, nine months long. Everything else has taken a much longer time. Finally, just to, to mention the problem of gentrification. Um, gentrification may be defined as the process uh, by which higher income households displace lower income residents, changing the character of the neighborhood. Um, displacement, physical upgrading, and change in neighborhood character is one of the main problems that we're confronting at the moment, and it's still we're still asking ourselves, what is the most effective way for us to, to confront the problem of gentrification in the neighborhood initiative? So let me end by uh, posing a series of questions. 
what is a university's rationale? Why should a university um, engage with its neighborhood? The answers to this question will determine the, the steps that you might take. For example, um, many universities might simply want to work with their neighborhood f to generate good public relations or good political will. Um, uh, there, uh, we have felt that the, our rationale was that it was a socially responsible thing for AUB to do to engage with its neighborhood and that it was also good for us and our academic mission. How should a university institutionalize engagement with its neighborhood? And by this I mean um, where should an initiative be placed organizationally in a university and according to what sort of a time frame? Um, is, it, uh, is it a time limited project? Or um, should a university be undertaking a longer term commitment to make this engagement possible? So project versus uh, a program that's uh, of longer time frame and where it should belong. How are priorities set? Are the, the priorities set by academic uh, preferences and academic interests, by donor interests, or do priorities derive from what concerns uh, neighbors themselves? And how do you find out what concerns neighbors themselves? And what types of actions should be considered and are appropriate for a university? Um, <clears throat> what I've described here are everything from uh, one-off events, such as the, the smoke-free event in the neighborhood, um, some outreach projects that involve a longer commitment with neighborhood partners, um, and then research projects that have either um, policy outcomes or possibly interventions. But I think one of the things that we've struggled with is that we as a university, we are not the government, and nor are we a non-governmental organization. So we have to figure out what is our comparative advantage as a university when we um, embark on a neighborhood initiative. And what will motivate faculty and students to participate? Uh, this is a really critical question because both faculty and students are busy with their academic programs and um, what will get faculty and students motivated to do research um, is an important question. At AUB, faculty uh, are interested in publishing uh, from this research and that's a very important motivation and we've had to think about how to create a wide enough agenda to allow faculty to publish on more theoretical questions as well as practical questions. And students as well, um, what motivates students to participate. Some want to be better citizens and that's really important. And finally, what are the best ways to build meaningful, durable relations with neighbors? Um, and this is a, a really big challenge because the power at least with us, and I think it's so from all the other experience I've read about in other neighborhood initiatives, the power difference between university professors and neighbors is great. And how do you create um, partnerships when the power differences are so great? Um, and relationships that are uh, durable over time, where respect is created and where you listen to neighbors. That's really um, a very big challenge. So I'll end with Eljar Eljar. Thank you very much. I Dr. Nabil Samahmi. I'm not a historian. I'm 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 a تنمية المجتمع أو قطاع البيئة تنمية المجتمع في الجامعة هو إطار الشكلي 
نلاقي تخطى مضمون ان احنا بنظبط مجموعه بايلتس بنعمل عمليه تنسيق فهو واقع الامر ان احنا عندنا يمكن كونفليكت في فهم معنى انا ما اعتقدش ابدا ان اللي تبنى هذه الفكره من دي نمبر 1 كان بيفكر انه قطاع البيئه وتنميه المجتمع على مستوى الجامعات المصريه يصل به الحل ان احنا احنا في مجالس الكليات ويسمونا اساتذه الموجودين هنا انجازات وكيل البيئه يا جماعه احنا ظبطنا التايلت في الدور الثالث وخلي بالكم الحنفيات نظيفه والتايلتس مش عارف ايه فانا بس اخشى ما اخشى ان احنا ن ن ن بن بنحاول نطرح سؤال علشان ندافع بيها عن انفسنا. دكتور نبيل عارف انا عارف ان احنا قماشه واحده بس حضرتك سامحني لانه مش لا انا حضرتك انا اسف دكتور صح لا ابدا ما عندي اسئله كتير طب انا عايزه ارد بس برضه على لا عشان بس موضوع المجتمع والعلم والجامعة معمول يعني هدف من الجامعة هو التعليم أساسا ولا خدمة المجتمع فأنا متهيألي إن المفروض إنه دور الجامعة إن هي بتعلم بس المفروض إن هي بتصدر طالب أو مهندس أو فرد من المجتمع اللي بيخدم المجتمع يعني احنا حتى في أي مهنة بنطلعها بعد كده الطبيب بيخدم المجتمع المهندس بيخدم المجتمع ففي علاقه وثيقه ما بين العلم وخدمه المجتمع. استاذني دكتور سحر معلش استاذني دكتور سحر بس هو ده مش موضوع لا معلش انا قلت حضرتك لان الموضوع ده مهم جدا. انت بتقاطعني كتير كده يا دكتور مش عشان انت رئيس قسم يعني. مش هتعمل تاني خالص بس حضرتك هتدي لي رساله المشن والفيجن بتاع انا محتاج بس ان احنا نتفق على المشن والفيجن بتاع قطاع تنميه المجتمع والبيئه على مستوى الجامعات المصريه مش اكتر من كده. وانا مش هتكلم تاني خالص. لا لا طبعا انت عارف يعني اوكي سينت اي هاف ماني كويستشنز اكشولي سو اي دونت نو اف يو وونت مي تو سبيل ذيم ون باي ون اور اي اوكي ويل فيرست اوف اول اي وونتد تو نو ويذر يو ديد اني اويرنس بروجرام فور ذا كوميونيتي بيفور ستارتنج ذا ورك اور بيفور ايفن دوينج ذا سيرفيس اور يو جاست دروبد ان ذا كوميونيتي اند ستارتد تو اسك Uh, people and surveying the people and they were like asking you what are you doing so did you do any awareness or uh, did you do like a public hearing for everyone or did you gather the community this is uh, my first question the second question was um, uh, you said in the beginning that the activities were supported by grants so uh, who did give these grants i mean did, did you ask for grants or you had grants so you started the process which one came first the grant or the the project. Uh, the third question is, uh, you said that uh, you, you did some studies, like the scenarios for improving parking, uh, I don't know, congestion, all this stuff. Uh, who funded these studies? I mean, like the other departments of uh, engineering departments or anthropology or whatever, uh, they were doing this, I mean, like a volunteer work or uh, were they paid? Uh, so I would like to know this. And what was the level of the study? I mean, uh, was it just a, a, a pre-studies, a feasibility study, or really you had uh, in-depth studies that would be able to be implemented uh, directly? Uh, and uh, what, when I mean, what I mean about uh, level, I mean, did you do, for example, a feasibility study to, to calculate cost of implementing these studies, uh, so which means until the end? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm asking too many questions because we have this project in Cairo University, so I'm interested to maybe we we will share uh, ideas with May and we can work maybe both uh, universities uh, in parallel. Uh, why why would you like to avoid the gentrification? Now this is a little bit philosophical because uh, it could happen anyway. So since gentrification comes without planning and it happens, so I guess that it would be also difficult to. To plan to, to avoid it, uh, so I would like to know your opinion about that. And uh, the selection of the projects, uh, all this set of projects, did you select them with the people, or did you just uh, uh, conclude them from their answers in the survey, 
or did you sit and you, because also you ask at the end about the priorities, like, okay? how did it go with the people, uh, with the community, so did you set a, a set of, uh, of projects like, for example, this uh, smoking thing, I think this was not the people's, I think it was, maybe the people complained, for example, for the handicap, so you, you decided that you should do something, I mean, I, the process as well of, of selection, and my final question about how, how would you think uh, uh, this project can be sustained uh, without, because the university is not an NGO, and here I, I back uh, Nabil about that, uh, so finally, you do a project even with the students or with yourself or with any of the research uh, grants you have, but at the end of the day, you're not staying there forever. So how would you suggest that such a project would be sustained? And I'm sorry for the many questions. Okay. Yes, this is an encyclopedia of questions. <laughs> I hope I can do them justice. Um, first of all, um, the um, awareness in the community. Um, and we spent a year uh, basically conducting many interviews with residents and businesses, um, in-depth interviews with residents and businesses. Uh, and we, uh, and from those in-depth interviews, we got a sense of what people were concerned about. We weren't asking them what they thought the university should be doing. We were asking them more, what were the issues that were affecting the quality of their lives? What were they most concerned about on a daily basis? And it was the answers to those kinds of questions from those interviews that helped us create our priorities. Um, so, um, you had asked about setting priorities. The smoking uh, question is an interesting one. Um, we knew that the smoking ban was coming into effect, and uh, neighborhood, some neighborhood restaurants actually approached our colleagues at AUB uh, about um, help working with them to educate their staff about kind of what would happen with the ban. So in a way, it, that is a more recent uh, development, but that actually did come from the neighborhood as well. One of the things that, um, when I've actually um, read, studied the literature about neighborhood programs, one of the things that um, many people have said is that it's often uh, counterproductive to organize a large public visioning session. Because um, what it does is it, it raises uh, expectations about what a university might deliver. And it creates many more problems and it kind of puts the university in a position of sort of being um, the um, giver of resources when in fact uh, that's really, and, and becoming uh, something that you don't want to be. So what we have found is that we've we have multiple channels of communication. All of, many of us involved with these projects actually live in the neighborhood as well. So uh, priorities are actually coming out of our own lived experience uh, of what the issues are in the neighborhood. So it's a, it's a mix of multiple sources of information feeding into how we set our priorities. But we've never had a sort of large public visioning uh, because Certainly, the literature suggests that that can backfire. Um, the studies would they pay? The studies who paid the studies? The studies you said who paid? Who, who yes, the, um, the the idea uh, of the neighborhood initiative came first, and then we went and sought funding. Um, we have funding from s several sources uh, uh, from some Lebanese sources, the Lebanese National uh, Sci Center for Scientific Research, um, from uh, the Ford Foundation, from uh, a small foundation in the United States, um, and some uh, Lebanese donors as well. Um, but actually, when you look at our annual budget, the, the major part of our budget is actually paid for by AUB itself, by the university, and a small part comes from uh, our activities. Um, the the kind when we support research, um, we're we're funding the costs of research assistants, some equipment for data collection. Um, it's uh, um, it's uh, 
the research costs are actually quite uh, some interviewers uh, uh, um, implementation um, <coughs> actually um, all of this work has taken a very long time uh, when uh, a university uh, uh, an initiative such as ours makes a commitment to work with faculty and we could have gone out and hired consultants and organized projects and um, done the projects ourselves as the neighborhood initiative, but that would have defeated the purpose of engaging the university faculty and students. And when you make the commitment to engaging the university faculty and students, you um, embark on a, a much slower process than what you would like. Uh, and um, uh, so right now, the, uh, the only project that has actually reached a point where we might be talking about implementation is the Jean d'Arc pedestrian friendly model, where the design uh, and other research on the street has actually fed into our design. And we're now talking with the municipality about implementing our design. Um, but, uh, for example, the congestion research, um, we made some recommendations to a group of government policymakers about improving Bliss Street, and um, the police, actually the Ministry of Interior representatives at our meeting said, you can't do any of these recommendations until you solve the parking problem. And so we went back to the issue of kind of solving the parking problem in research. So, but this is a question. Uh, what should a role of a university be in implementation? Do you simply um, contribute the knowledge and the technical expertise and then work with the implementers kind of in, a, in an advisory capacity or something else. We, we are not ourselves implementing projects, but we're to the point where we're working with partners who will be implementing them. Um, gentrification. Um, this is a very interesting question. Um, I, I personally think, and many colleagues think, that gentrification is bad for our neighborhood, and that it is displacing many people who have lived for generations in the neighborhood because they can't afford to pay rents anymore or shopkeepers can't afford to pay the increasing rents. Um, the neighborhood is being transformed by these luxury high-rise buildings that have only part-time residents in them who probably drive their cars into their underground parking garages and never set foot on the neighborhood streets, shopping in the shops. So, um, at least from our perspective, uh, gentrification um, is, a, is a bad thing. It's, it's also making the neighborhood very unaffordable for most everybody who's connected to the Lebanese local economy. Um, but uh, how you deal with gentrification is really a big issue. We've been advocating that the university administration do more to promote affordable housing in the neighborhood for university staff and faculty, but for others, uh, because affordable housing seems to be one strategy that might counteract gentrification. But it's a very complicated issue, and it's not we're, we're not a, at all clear even yet what's the intelligent way to approach the problem. أول حاجة بشكرك على سؤالي اللقاء وكان عندي سؤال في القدرة على الدمج بين خصوصية الجامعة بالذات في وضع أمني مضطرب والتعاون مع الأهالي. كمان كنت عايز اسال الى اي مدى بيبقى فيه مشاركه ماديه من الطلبه نفسهم؟ يس 
ask a question. Uh, students, uh, I'll take the second question first. Students uh, volunteer uh, for many activities. Um, students also do uh, some of this work as part of their courses, so they get credit for the work. For example, many of the civil engineering courses uh, have involved students, I mean, from the rainwater harvesting design to traffic uh, traffic counts and uh, interviews with neighborhood businesses about where their customers come from. Students have done this work as part of their courses. Um, and uh, some students are actually paid research assistants as well. So we have lots of different student participation. Um, next week, when we do our noise map of the campus, um, uh, the Student Environment Club is going to be helping us with some of the sound measurements around the campus. So again, uh, it's another different way. Uh, a student club is actually working with us on the noise map of the campus. Um, <clears throat> your question is a very good one about the wall. Uh, and. Um, we talk a, a lot about breaking down the wall. Um, we actually worked with um, some architecture colleagues on a design studio about the wall and breaking down the wall. And the students actually came up with design scenarios for how we could break down the wall, both physically in a, in a design sense as well as sociologically. Um, but what we try to do is we try to bring more people onto campus from the neighborhood. So we have um, uh, many different ways that we invite neighbors to events that take place on campus. But we also go out to the neighborhood. And um, for example, the, um, the, uh, when we presented our findings of the health survey with the 10 posters in three different locations in the neighborhood, um, that uh, uh, we, we feel very much that um, we also ourselves need to go out more. We, when the smoking uh, day, um, we, we had a, a neighborhood party. We had the Raspe Rasa Sena, a neighborhood party. Um, we've, um, we've actually had AUB students in, from the agriculture faculty sell organic plants on the streets of the neighborhood. So we've been trying to bring us us out into the neighborhood and vice versa. Thank you Dr. Mohamed Gandhi for this wonderful presentation. The truth is, the most important thing in the world is that he is trying to get a message to the students. And I think that the universities in Mexico الدول العربية عموما هي بتمثل جزء من القوة الطاردة المركزية اللي احنا خلناها في مكينيك سنتفجل فورس اللي هي بتطرد الطلبة خارج حضرتهم وخارج مجتمعاتهم وفي رأيي ان ده لانها بتكرس نموذج البيزنس مان البيزنس مان وفي رأيي ان نظام الدرجات اللي عندنا هو نوع من يعني نوع من سيمبل يعني هو نظام رمزي في البيزنس خدت كم درجة ها مفيش أي حاجة عندنا في الكلية بتقيس درجة العطاء الاجتماعي ولا درجة التعاون ولا درجة العمل الجماعي مفيش أي حاجة بتقيس يعني لو أنا إنسان أناني جدا وفردي جدا هبقى نموذج رائع ها في نظام الحالي للجامعات المصرية والنقطة كلها هي إن أنا لو أنا بتكلم عن البيزنس يبقى الموضوع بأخده على استقامته هنجح في بيزنس ازاي؟ مش ده هكون في بلدي. في ناس يقول لها اول ما اتخرج اروح الصين لان الصين هي مصنع العالم واعمل مصنع في الصين. خبر اسود. يعني عايز اقول طبعا دكتور محمد قال لي قبل كده ان الطلبه لسه ما اتخرجوش يقولوا ازاي ان احنا اول ما نتخرج هنحاجز خارج بلدنا. وده بيثير القضيه في منتهى الخطوره هي يعني ما هو نموذج الشخصيه اللي عايزين نزرعه في بلدنا؟ بمعنى صح لو قلنا ان في حاجه اسمها البطل فكره البطل ما هي ملامح البطل اللي احنا عايزين نقله للطالب ها لان احنا بصراحه كده كل دوله وكل امه ها في مرحله ما محتاجه لرسم ملامح الشخصيه المناسبه لهذه المرحله 
هل احنا في المرحلات الحاليه محتاجين اكثر للنموذج البيزنس ومحتاجين ان احنا نبقى يعني يعني ماشيين مع العلماء ولا محتاجين اكثر لفكره الاستقلال الحضاري التنميه المستقله الاعتماد على الذات بناء القدرات الذاتيه فانا رايي ان ارجع تاني لاهميه العرض ان هو بياكد اهميه زراعه البعد الرساله للطالب بدءا من دخوله في الجامعه انا لسه داخل اعدادي وبتحول الى مجرد رقم في كشف ومليش اي مجرد وعاء فارغ يتلقى العلم لكن انا ممكن اول خلال هذا النموذج اقول ايوه انت يا ابني انت مش مجرد وعاء فارغ انت عضو منتمي لمجتمعك المحلي يعني انت مش صفر انت في عندك مومنتم اكتسبته من خلال انك انت عضو مجتمع المحلي وده انت ممكن تبقى اكتف ها من اول يوم وانت داخل الكليه معنى صح ايه؟ هذا نموذج بيقول ليه ما الطالب ما من من نعلموش ان هو يبقى قدم في الجامعه وقدم في المجتمع المحلي. ولو حبيت اكمل على البعد الرساله اللي طرحته هذه المحاضره الجميله اقول يعني دكتور محمد دكتور مصطفى صبري كان عرض مره فاتت نظام المعلومات عن الطلبه. فاخر في دماغي في دماغي نظام معلومات عن الطلبه عشان ايه؟ يعني لازم ما هي الهدف من نظام معلومات الطلبه؟ انا مجرد بس كشف الطلبه ليه ما, ما نقولش تعالوا نعرف كل طالب ها بالحي اللي ساكن فيه. انت يا ابني مش هو الخير، انت من حلوان، انت من كذا، وكمل بقى على الكلام كله انت من شركة يا ابني انت من حلوان ولا من اسوان ولا من 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 بتكلم عن بتكلم عن جذور الطالب وبالتالي انا انا نفسي في الكليه هتعلم منه لان هعرف ما هو ما الذي يجري في هذا المكان واهله ان هو يكون عضو فاعل وهنا بقى اعمل قنطره حقيقيه بين بين اللي ياخدوا في علم علم في الكليه وبين قضايا مجتمع المحلي اللي ممكن تبقى امكانات ما حدش شايفها فرص ما حدش شايفها ها فيعني انا انا طبعا سعيد جدا وارجو ان احنا يعني نستفيد هذا العرض الجميل في دعم البعد الرسالي اللي ممكن هو يحمي الطالب من الاغتراب يحميه من الضياع وهو داخل كليه كبيره جدا يعني شو من المدرسه للكليه انها رهيبه نفسيا لكن اللي يحميه من الضياع انه عارف ان هو لسه اللي صار مفاعل محلي وان هو ليه دور كابن ابناء مفاعل محلي Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, informative presentation. Um, I just want to comment on a couple of issues and then I have a couple of questions. Um, first, um, I, I see your initiative as, as very important um, to our communities um, these days um, uh, with a very high um, importance. Uh, the reason being is um, that everything that we see around us is uh, being implemented without having any base uh, of research or scientific research. So everything is, done, is just done without why, yeah? And the very, uh, the, uh, the problem in our universities, uh, in schools uh, as well, that students learn things, and this goes back to uh, May's uh, question, that students ask her, why do we do that? Why do we have to learn this? And if this is not linked to the, the real world, which they will face later on, then there is no point in it. They will, they will just forget about it. So research is very important, and this needs to feed into the education, the learning. So learning without research that has practical implication and is related to the community itself, I don't think uh, it will have any benefit um, in, the, in the future for the students. And this brings um, me back to when I was at the university. Um, the, the saying was, yeah, you just learn here in the university, and what, when you go out there, it has nothing to do with what you've learned. It's a totally different world. And this is what we don't want to happen now. We want to link real life with the research that fits into the um, education. Um, back to the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, after you've started your initiative from 2008, if I remember correctly, so how would you assess your initiative today, after more than around five years or so? How would you assess it? What would you change? Uh, what, what are your future plans? And um, um, the second question was actually with the implementation. I think you, you have touched upon. Thank you very much. These are excellent questions also. Thank you. Um, 
Well, I would assess it. I think that um, uh, generally, I think that we're moving in the right direction. Um, but I think that it's taken much, much longer than I would have predicted to actually have anything to show. And um, this is, I think, something that maybe will, will need to be considered also here. Uh, because, as I mentioned uh, to Dr. Sahar's uh, question as well, when you commit to working with faculty and students, things take a long time. And then you have to figure out um, what is your role, um, wh where does the university role end and the other partners' roles begin. And these things are things that we're still struggling with. Uh, I mean, I think in the case of the Jean d'Arc Street project, um, it was very lucky for us that the mayor of Beirut got very excited about uh, the idea of a model pedestrian street in the city. If we didn't have uh, an interested mayor uh, who was really looking for something that he could also take credit for himself as his uh, contribution to the city, um, it would have been, uh, I think, much more difficult. So I think, in general, um, I would say that we're moving in the right directions, but the, the question of where you take research and, and what what is the intelligent way of approaching implementation is really an open question. Um, um, what would I change? Um, I think I, I'm not sure I would change anything, actually. Um, I mean, at the beginning, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, Ras Beirut uh, uh, is uh, a middle class, or many people might even say, an upper middle class neighborhood now with all the gentrification. And many of my colleagues actually felt that outreach should only be done for disadvantaged neighborhoods and disadvantaged communities, and that the university had no business spending any of its energy in its own neighborhood. And I think one of the things that we've had to argue is that if you take a mutual benefit argument that um, that the it, it's good for the university to be having this engagement with the neighborhood um, that it could be any place really but this but it uh, so long as you're um, enriching your academic mission by this engagement with a place I think that's a really key thing so another thing um, many of our colleagues had, very low expectations of what a neighborhood initiative would be. They thought it was mainly a public relations exercise, that in fact it was simply us organizing nice events for our neighborhood that would you know, convince everybody that AUB wanted to be a good neighbor. And what we've tried to show was that um, if we involve faculty in the research and thinking about these issues, we can actually make a much more substantial contribution to the neighborhood that also benefits us. By the way. So um, that, that's been uh, an ongoing struggle as well. But I think that we've convinced our um, the skeptics that engaging with this middle class neighborhood um, it's useful for the neighborhood, but it's also useful for us. Um, future plans. Um, again, uh, at the moment, I think uh, we're coming up to uh, a six-year mark. Uh, and I think that we will probably continue to be responsive to our uh, neighbors and what they're concerned about, this uh, gentrification issue. Um, the, the, the difficulties that small businesses are facing and how we um, help, uh, how we reach out to small businesses uh, as a university. Uh, I think those are some of the things that we'll be working on. Um, but I don't think that we'll change our basic way of operating uh, in the future. We may just be 
uh, working on other issues or other dimensions. And as you can see, uh, the, con the congestion work we started five years ago, and we still have much more to go. So we're looking at a lot of this work kind of over multiple years, really, um, that includes research and kind of engagement with neighbors and more research and, and policy discussions and possibly some sort of intervention at the end. Um, so uh, it's, it's really a, a time commitment that I think is a, a long commitment of time that I think is also very important. I want to ask about the science and the science of the world. Is there a very important issue in the issue of the world? Or is there another issue in the issue of the world? Until now, uh, it is the noise work where uh, psychology and psychiatry are both uh, involved. Um, we have uh, maybe the well-being survey also. Uh, well-being uh, did not include anybody from the department of psychi uh, psychology or psychiatry. No, there were sociologists and anthropologists, but no psychi psychologists. In, in part. I mean, again, one of the questions when you make a commitment to working with faculty is faculty also have to be interested in working on neighborhood issues. And many times when we've asked faculty to get involved with us, um, they've said, well, I'm too busy, my, my research specialty is in another direction, this isn't really what I'm interested in right now. So again, it has to be um, uh, also from their interest. First, I think one of the keys to success in, in such an initiative or in any other initiative that's maybe going to follow your model uh, is the sort of partnerships uh, that you have established uh, basically within the university, of course, to start with, with the multidisciplinary approach uh, and the other partnerships outside the university with any sort of uh, uh, corporate uh, or any companies involved, etc. Uh, I'm just interested to know uh, within the university the sort of challenges that we, that you faced uh, with the multidisciplinary approach. Um, basically, was it was it easy to start with? Was there a structured sort of mechanism in the university that allowed for that? Uh, was there any sort of? Uh, as I saw in one of the slides, there was like 20, 25 disciplines involved in some in one of the projects. So, yeah, exactly. And uh, this is a very interesting um, sort of uh, approach to have all these disciplines involved. And uh, because uh, in some universities it becomes, in, in, where it is really unstructured, it becomes sort of problematic to engage other disciplines to start with, uh, especially with, with topics like these that really need a lot of uh, uh, multidisciplinary engagement. Um, so, you know, I just, just wanted to go through the, the minutiae of how, how the mechanism uh, worked and where they did it start over with just a few and then uh, it continued with, uh, with you know, how, how it really worked. Uh, the second question is more of, uh, more related to, um, since, you know, having done all of, all of this work and uh, since you, you yourself have spent more than a decade in Cairo, um, is there, can you just give us any insight uh, regarding the, the challenges that we may face uh, and, and sort of uh, speaking about the different, you know, the culture, the, you know, whatever insight you have regarding an initiative like the EUB initiative when it is, um, uh, when we start applying this, do you have any insight that you can uh, uh, feed us back with? Thank you. About the multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approaches, um, in fact, I think that it's very difficult to talk about this in the abstract. Um, you actually have to um, start with a particular problem that then people can see themselves contributing to solving. So um, when we started with congestion, we said who, who, which disciplines actually have something to contribute to 
uh, understanding the problem of congestion. And initially, we simply started with civil engineers and with urban designers, and nobody else. They were the ones who were involved. Um, and then we brought in others um, to um, kind of help us think about kind of the business case for a parking garage and things like that. But, but uh, uh, I mean, and, and the noise, uh, the noise example is actually a very interesting one because that's the, the first time that we've actually had such a broad cross-section of people represented. And people come to our meetings, we have once monthly meetings where uh, members of the group present to each other what their discipline says about noise. And there's such excitement in the room because this is such a rare thing. But that's actually a, a, a kind of very unusual example. Usually we start with a, a few key disciplines uh, that have something to contribute to addressing a, a specific, uh, a more specific problem. Um, noise, as you can see, has so many multiple dimensions to it. We had um, last week a presentation by one of our colleagues from Fine Arts who showed us um, images from the arts of kind of tranquil, um, tranquil, uh, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional works of art that ins inspire a certain tranquility. And it was very interesting for our engineers and the psychiatrists and others to actually think with her about what she was saying about art. Um, but uh, but, inter but multidisciplinary work, I think, is best started around a problem as the starting point, not in the abstract. Um, challenges for Cairo, I mean, I think one of the things that we have learned is the importance of being humble. And when you want to create relations, particularly with neighborhood partners, uh, it's so important for you to appreciate the power that you have as a university professor working in a prestigious institution and how intimidating that is to people. Uh, in the neighborhood, and and uh, how how important it is to listen. Our greening project almost fell apart at one point because our design team came in with some great ideas for green walls and kind of had all sorts of very enthusiastic proposals for a neighborhood school. And the neighborhood school people felt that they weren't being listened to, and so. I mean, from what I remember about Cairo, my days here, um, the kind of universities are very prestigious, powerful institutions, and neighborhoods may be disorganized and um, with residents and others who don't feel so powerful. And you really need to kind of deal with the power dimensions and listen and be humble. أولاً أنا سعيد بالمبادرة يعني سعيد بها أكثر عشان إحنا عندنا في قسم عمارة يعني حصلت مبادرات كتير حاولوا عندنا يربطوا طلبة من جامعات مختلفة من كليات مختلفة يربطوا طلبة بالجامعة نفسها بس ما حصلش إن إحنا نربط الجيران اللي بره والناس ونربط ثقافات مختلفة من هيئة التدريس والطلبة وكذا بس الحقيقة أنا عندي سؤال إن إحنا ك أنا كطالب عمارة يعني قسم عمارة أنا إزاي أقدر أخدم مجتمعي بدراسة يعني حاسس إن إحنا عندنا فجوة للأسف القاهرة دلوقتي بقت زحمة وبقت مشاكل والدنيا زحمة الواحد ما بقاش قادر إن هو يطور حتى في نفسه عشان يقدر يطور المجتمع بس فعايز أعرف خطوات فعلية أعملها إن أنا أقدر أنمي بلدي يعني Thank you very much, uh, Celia, um, for this interesting uh, presentation, and which really offered us a lot of food for thought. And um, um, I have a comment and a question, and my comment maybe is related to um, what was brought up you know, uh, earlier uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Nabil's awareness, lest a project like this can compromise the way I understood your question, the role of the university. Well, I think it is 
if we proceed with it, it's a very, very empowering right tool for the university. I mean, um, because as I understood, you know, you said uh, one of um, your project can be described as an intervention, all right, uh, in a society and with a government that is corrupt and, um, uh, and weak. And, you know, no, no, nobody doubts that we are going, you know, through something very similar. So I think if the university is able, all right, to step outside and do this, then it's really affecting, we're going from bottom up, and it would be a very, very empowering, uh, you know, uh, tool and role, all right, to the university. Now, my wariness, you know, about this is that until this very moment, and this is my question to you, Cynthia, uh, the uh, overall, right, um, uh, faculty is really totally apathetic towards issues that have to do with the university itself, let alone, all right, uh, uh, serving or offering something outside the university. So I think maybe a, a great deal of work we have to do you know, in this initial stage of really bringing home, all right, to our colleagues the importance of such, you know, an important step um, and, uh, and, and, and like, you know, the, the rationale behind it, the philosophy, how this, in, in, in a sense, will be good for the well-being of the university community and then, all right, or with it, probably, or simultaneously, with the community outside the university. Thank you. To the architecture student, uh, um, well, I think um, certainly when I was an architecture student, um, we had what was called an urban design workshop where we actually, as students, offered um, uh, technical assistance and free advice to local municipal municipalities and local groups who needed some urban design assistance. And I don't know if there are student organizations or if there's actually a structure where um, there could be a sort of urban design workshop that could offer free advice. I mean, I know in many places in the world and, and maybe even here um, in, in Cairo, um, law schools offer legal aid clinics to people who uh, can't afford to pay for a lawyer. Um, dental students offer dental care to people who can't pay for dental services. Um, I mean, uh, students, uh, I mean, there, there would be, I would imagine, at least a possibility at this moment in time where there's so many important challenges facing Egypt and Cairo for you to leap on the moment of creating an urban design workshop or architecture workshop where you could volunteer with uh, groups who need your, your technical advice. That might be one thing to think about. So volunteering what you, what you have, uh, what, what you know. Um, and often um, um, groups like this you know, have a hard time visualizing, and I think this is what you know how to do now, and and, and could help them. Um, so that's what I can think of at the moment, anyway. <coughs> In terms of uh, your question uh, and about uh, the faculty being apathetic, I mean, I, uh, I mean, I, you know, we all hope that we can inspire a certain kind of citizenship in faculty and students and in, encourage uh, uh, this sort of a commitment to their own communities by faculty and students. Um, but I, I think we also need to be realistic that that may not be the strongest motivating factor for faculty or students to get involved in this work at the beginning. Um, and one of the things that, I mean, I, I, one of my final questions was what motivates faculty to get involved? And I think that question needs to be asked here and you need to answer it here uh, in terms of what the, motivate, what the motivating factors would be. Um, for us, um, a, a lot of it had to do with faculty wanting to be able to do interesting research and to be able to publish from it so that they got promoted. And so 
we had to we had to say we had to give them enough room to be able to do research on the kind of theoretical questions that they were interested in or the practical work whatever they're interested in um, uh, that will help them become promoted and by the way then they get very excited about the process and are interested in the chance to do something for their community um, but I mean first pressures are at least at AUB for faculty to publish or for example in the case of our art colleague from fine arts she got very interested in the idea of creating some installations around the issue of silence that then she could publish from and um, and so she's participating in the noise group um, because she's interested in you know what we might do when it comes to creating some installations around silence so you have to figure out what motivates faculty and be realistic about it I think واحنا عندنا المفروض الخطوه اللي بعد كده هي ورشه في اخر الشهر ده غالبا هتبقى 26 و 27 ابريل واحنا خدنا المعلومات بتاعت حضراتكم وهنبلغكم وبيها هيبقى فيها شق ورشه مقفول على الناس اللي هتشارك وفي شق برده عام لسه هن هنظبطه وبعدين نقول لحضراتكم هو هيبقى ايه بالظبط و ولو في حد من الطلبه او من الفاكلتي حابين ان هم يشاركوا معانا في الورشه دي يعني يا ريت يقولوا لنا احنا موجودين لسه شويه. Uh, we'll see you at the end of the day.